Yeah, it's like when you roast a chicken and it's got the little meda- the medallions on the bottom that are just for the the chef that you pull what? out. Huh? What? The, I don't know if you guys roast chickens. If you roast a chicken under underneath, there's a secret meat compartment on yeah. the bottom what? of the chicken. Yes, there's a secret yeah. meat compartment that has two little nubbins of meat, and there no one people just throw it out. They forget about the medallion. What are you? What it's are you the, talking about? There's coins. It's the chef's oh. treat. It's the chef's treat. I think the French call it an oyster. I've seen Emily, so I know about this. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, they're medall- the medallions are like coins in the same way that uh, like the chocolate coins around Christmas and Hanukkah. Are oh like yes. coins. So they're little like gold foil wrapped morsels of chicken. <laughs> yeah, they were they were provided to the chicken to ease its passage across the river Styx. There you go. Yeah. There you oh go. yeah, okay. <laughs> placed over each eye. Yeah. But then, but then the chef eats the coins. Yeah. Or uses them in Dave and Buster's. <laughs> <laughs> this is a beautiful you have all built some beautiful lore here. I want I want to add that to our to our existing Goosebuds lore that we put we put coins on corpses so they have some something to play when they reach Dave and Buster's in the afterlife. Oh my god. Well, here here's the new theory. Just um, okay. bear with me here. Okay. You know how arcades went away, right? Like mm-hmm. they came and went as far as trend go, as far as yeah. the industry goes. Yeah. Well, they had to go somewhere, right? Oh, my. Wow. I see where you're going. Arcades in hell. In hell. Is, <laughs> you can tell me whether or not that's an R.L. Stein book. <laughs> <laughs> the arcade in hell. I think it's on the horizon. I think he's working on that one. I, I <laughs> love the temptation also, because I'm assuming this is a, if this is a Dave & Buster's, this is a prize arcade. This is a, oh, yeah. oh, you know, there are some really nice things in this hell prize booth, like a bottle of water. Wouldn't you love a bottle of water? You're so thirsty. Mm. But you got to get like 300 tickets. I would assume mm-hmm. that every prize is a monkey's paw too, right? Mm. <laughs> like if the, it's a bottle of water, but it's like it's going to monkey's paw you. It's true. Regular arcades. I famously, I don't, I don't know if you've all heard of this, but I famously once bought a smoothie machine with uh, arcade tickets. No, you've <laughs> never told me. <laughs> what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> What was that like? Eight figures of tickets. What did you What did you pay and what did you play to get the tickets? What was the cost? <laughs> I think it was ten thousand tickets. I I figured out that I could earn earn. I could I could win about a uh, thousand playing this dumb like uh like you're. You you put a coin in and it like skis down a slope and into a yes. rotating drum. Yeah, those ones rock. Yeah, mm-hmm. you could you could win about like a hundred tickets if you timed it right and you just like got the rhythm correct. Mm-hmm. So played the game right. Mm. I think I was uh, seventeen years old. Uh, that sounds about right. And you want a smoothie machine? I want a smoothie machine. Worked for like three to five smoothies. <laughs> This sounds like the plot of an episode of Cousin Skeeter. Like there's Wow, what a pull. I'm like because you would watch the episode and say no one could win that from an arcade. This is obviously the writers have never been to an arcade before. <laughs> no one could win a good functioning smoothie. Also, a smoothie does not require its own. You just need a blender. It's a for blender. That. Yeah, I'm picturing like a, a weird like easy bake oven thing where you can only use the prepackaged powders for your smoothies, and once you use those, they're you're out. Mm, soylent. Yeah, so proprietary soylent smoothies. Yeah. Yeah. But the prize was being able to go on a podcast and brag about winning a smoothie with determination as a teenager. It's still paying out for you, baby. Where's that machine? It's broken. Oh. It's in hell. It's in hell at Dave and Buster's. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a real monkey's ball situation. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Goosebuds. Welcome to Goosebuds. I'm Paul. I'm Kevin. I'm Chad. And we have a guest with us today. Uh, Adam, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Adam. I, you guys knew, you, you've done nicknames on previous episodes. Uh, oh, sure. Ma- yeah. Maggot Man. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> peanut Butter Nut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. These are all true. How do you earn one of the how many how many tickets is a nickname? <laughs> oh man. Uh we could we could furnish you with a nickname if you want, but if do you have anything in mind? I feel like it's our honor to bestow a nickname on you if you want. One. I think we gave ourselves the, all those nicknames. So I, honestly, I think you can kind of pick one for yourself if they you They were like. from they were from the book we were reading. That's right. You yeah, you earn it through the material. So may, maybe we just need to let that one unfurl organically but anyway thanks for having me goose buds i'm excited to be here oh thanks so much for being here excited to have you we're gonna go over a couple of comics uh, of the comic man thing today 
And you, Adam, have a, a show about Man Thing. I do. I, I host a podcast called Man Thing Minute. Uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, we refer to ourselves in the community as fan things. Beautiful. I knew it. Uh, Great. If you are uh, if you are familiar with some of the later escapades, we are giant size fan things. If you are a particularly <laughs> ardent fan of the man thing, uh, and I am. I'm sitting uh, at my work from home and podcasting setup. I am facing a wall entirely decorated in man thing paraphernalia God damn. Uh, which if you if you can imagine uh, largely uh, non-existent you can't buy this stuff right <laughs> so uh, a lot of this was crafted blood sweat and tears uh, by more talented people than me oh. uh, i love the character and i don't like what i'm here for mm. um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I apologize. I apologize for what we've put you through for this podcast. Uh, Adam, we were seeing a beautiful movie, RRR. We've, we've seen it a couple times together now. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's, oh, great. It's, a, it's a wonderful experience. Uh, and last time I saw you, I, I walked up to you and I was like, yo, I remembered that you do a Man Thing podcast. And we have mm-hmm. a podcast where we read the beautiful works of R.L. Stein. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was like, would you like to do it with me? And you were like, it's going to be really, this is going to be hard, man. This is going to be tough. <laughs> <laughs> to say anything nice about this man. Uh, uh-huh. And I apologize for putting you in that situation. But I, uh, the positive side, you do get to talk about Man Thing a little bit more in your life right now. Yeah, I do. And and you were kind enough to invite me to include some source material, if you will. Mm. Uh, so we'll get to talk a little bit about you know the background and context of what that character was up to in the 1970s, Mm -hmm. uh, written by uh, one of the guys who really made a name for the Man-Thing as a character in Marvel Comics. That guy is Steve Gerber. He was the kind of the genius behind the best years of the Man-Thing. Also a creator of Howard the Duck. All right. uh, Who was created in the pages of a Man-Thing comic. I got to mention Howard the Duck and Man-Thing have hung out. Yeah, they're pals. They're, it, the man thing doesn't have a lot of friends, mm-hmm. uh, but he's got at Sad. least two. Richard Rory, we'll talk about that guy. <laughs> Richard Rory, that guy's a, a lifelong loser. Yeah, a noted loser. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that guy later. And uh, Howard the Duck. You know what's funny? Just as an aside, Howard the Duck was created in the pages of a, a comic called Adventure into Fear, mm-hmm. uh, which preceded the the comic that we read today. And uh, when the Man Thing finally got his own book, they brought Howard back because he was such a fan favorite. Uh, but Marvel fucking hated Howard the Duck so much. <laughs> and when Steve Gerber wrote, uh, you know, basically a Donald Duck parody into the pages of a horror comic book, <laughs> mm-hmm, uh, yeah. the editors at Marvel were big mad. And you might say <laughs> giant size mad. And um, they ordered Steve Gerber to kill Howard. ASAP. So wow. in the, the the second appearance of Howard the Duck, Howard, uh, I shit you not, slips and falls off of a, a piece of rock and just dies, plummets to his death, and that's what fun. That's yeah. Not even not even like a a really cinematic death, just or uh, heroic or like any purpose or like need for it to happen. I think at that point, I think I think Gerber probably had a tenuous relationship with his supervisors mm. and editors, mm. and so I think if they ordered him to do that, he would have done so so callously that it would s- sacrifice the quality of the book, <laughs> you know, like as a fuck you, uh-huh. uh, which I uh, honestly, you know what? I appreciate Respect. it. Respect. great. Respect. And it still didn't manage to be as bad as the R.L. Stein run. Wow. These, these R.L. Stein <laughs> ones are real bad. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a couple of questions about man things since you're the expert, Adam. I yeah. wonder if I could ask you, I, you know, I tangentially know man thing. I, my, my, my main experience with him is as the, it was kind of like the, the ship for the Thunderbolts for a while. And that was real oh. fun. <laughs> My man, I'm so glad you brought that up. Can you say more? Because I want to talk about it. <laughs> well, uh, the Thunderbolts was a great run that I think uh, Marvel has kind of missed the boat before uh, doing any cinematic stuff. But it was uh-huh. a, uh, you know, it's Suicide Squad, right? It's the Marvel yep. version of Suicide Squad. Where do some villains get to be on a team? Usually there's one hero leading them along. And in this more recent run, like what, 2010, something like that? Uh, uh-huh. it, they were like, yeah, we're going to, I don't even remember how they got Man Thing, but it was like, hide. And Satana and Colossus, or not Colossus? I'm sorry, Juggernaut. Juggernaut is mm. on the team. That's Whoa, right. I think so. yeah. like we're just going to use Man Thing as our transportation, and essentially a way to just kind of like jump from dimension to dimension or time to time. And it was a real fun one run. Uh, it's the one. best. A like one of my favorite uses of of the character because a lot of writers, I just don't think they know quite what to do with this guy. He can't speak. He doesn't think. 
he can't really leave the swamps of Florida. <laughs> Maybe it's best that he doesn't speak, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I think it is best. Certainly is best. <laughs> I would argue that RL knew exactly what to do with Man Thing, and it was the exact wrong thing. It's just he, he followed it without anyone telling him otherwise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's fair. And maybe, you know, that's kind of in the lineage of, you know, man thing books just being weird. So yeah. there's that. Uh, but yeah, so uh, go figure that one of the more creative and successful uses of the character in a, in a contemporary sense was in the Thunderbolts, which was so great. That run was so great. And uh, the man thing has a connection to a very special aspect of the Marvel Universe. So, you know, like every movie in in the MCU now is all multiverse this, multiverse right. that, mm-hmm. so on, so, you know, all that stuff. Well, so uh, the multiverse is connected through a hub called the Nexus of All Realities mm-hmm. in the Marvel Universe, not just the movies, but in the comics. And the Man-Thing has been chosen as effectively the guardian of the Nexus of All Realities. Yeah. And that's because it's in his swamp. Yeah, that's right. It is like permeating through his swamp. Okay. Hmm. He is the bouncer of the multiverse. Okay. We even see we even see a version of it in the RL comics we're going to talk about um, today, right? Yeah. We do see a version. Yeah, so I, I'm not super I'm not super super versed in comics. So I I saw that and I just assumed it was RL going along with a whatever whim and whatever fancy he had in that moment. So no, yeah, so for the most part, it it is that a little bit, but it's also uh, it is canonical that that exists in his swamp in the other books, right? Right, right. Okay. He he kind of he does like a fifty percenter where he acknowledges the existence of the Nexus, but then he also creates some aspects that are not in other comics, which mm. is you know fine. You can come up with new material. So sure. and Man um, Thing was the first one to yell, "Get out of my swamp!" before Shrek. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Man Thing was the one who came up with the onion metaphor, which is funny. That's what Ooh, it was. That's what from it was. Shrek. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, my qu- actually, you know, my question for you is on just somehow good Thunderbolts is, and Adam, you know, I, I tip my hat to you for that, uh, <laughs> is I always thought Man-Thing was a quick copy of Swamp Thing because that's what Marvel and DC were doing off of each other for a while, right? You know, like, you got a character named w- Slade Wilson, we got Wade Wilson. Yeah, correct. And I got to say, uh, Man-Thing, I'm going to say this, and this is a probably blasphemous, but I think Man-Thing is cuter and cooler than Swamp I Thing. I agree. My man. I That's agree. right. Man, thing, man, thing's better. I always thought man, thing was better, but also, I mean, you'll know more reading it online. They came out within the same month or two of each other. Is that yeah, true? within two months of one another? And the story is pretty good too, because uh, man, thing was uh, created by a team at Marvel uh, as uh, Jerry Conway, Roy Thomas. Of course, yeah. Stan Lee named him. Uh, mm. No one wanted the name Man Thing, but Stan Lee <laughs> charged ahead with that one. And uh, uh, it, roommates with uh, Roy Thomas was a guy named Len Wein, yeah. who was one of the yeah. co-creators and and you know the the big names at DC who co-created Swamp Thing. So they were literally roommates and kind of copying each other's homework. And Man Thing came out uh, in uh, the spring of 1971, and Swamp Thing came out a few months later. That's so crazy to me, just, yeah, that they actually lived together, too. I know there's a lot of, like, kind of borrowing, and there wasn't much legal fighting over that sort of thing nowadays, but... Right. It's a, you know, it's great, though. There's a little collaboration, too, because Len Wein went to write man thing issues he wrote issues of the man thing after creating swamp thing oh sick and uh len's wife glennis is a colorist who worked on dc and marvel comics and a bunch of others and she worked on man thing books for a, a good long time so you know it's all it's kind of a cosmic gumbo <laughs> <laughs> just all working together I appreciate the sense of history, uh, but I'm actually more interested in what led you to become such a scholar of Man Thing, Adam. Yeah, like why, yes. why out of all the superheroes and all of like the world, why does Man Thing resonate with you so much? Uh oh, man, I'm trying to generate a funny answer, but no, be real, man, be real. This is not this is not a comedic podcast. This is serious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think that I think the thing is, is when you are growing up. To some degree, you have a choice over what you like, but sometimes it's just a gut feeling, right? Mm. And did any of you guys collect Marvel trading cards? You know, remember yeah. the yeah, like, I remember Marvel? Those. Yeah, yeah. I had a few coveted ones, but not didn't collect it. Yeah. Oh yeah, what did you have? Do you remember? Uh, the only one I remember that I had very dearly was a Gambit one, which felt appropriate. That's cool. Yeah, Gambit card, very meta. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Was it, it was just a, a spade. Yeah, but I couldn't <laughs> fling it at my enemies, right? Because I, I, need to, I need to keep it. Oh, yeah. That's a really good point. I love the idea that Chad just had a regular playing card and he called it his gambit card. <laughs> it's my gambit card. <laughs> Meanwhile, my dad's just mad he can't play poker with all of his friends. <laughs> He's missing one jack. <laughs> Doing a Creole accent up in my bedroom alone. I guarantee, Missy. <laughs> <laughs> Our son keeps calling me sugar. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. He took uh, off the shower rod curtain. He's just wheeling it around all over his head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, I, I remember I collected those cards. Me and my friends collected those cards. And we had a binder of cards. And mm-hmm. you know, for the most part, they were uh, Spider-Man cards. Because Spider-Man's rogue gallery is yeah. so great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had a Spider-Man card. Um and it had the man thing on it. And I don't know. I liked monsters. I was a monster kid. Big, mm. big, big Godzilla fan. Cool. And so uh, all of that stuff was just my jam as a kid. And I found something particularly fascinating about this one card with Spider-Man and this big shaggy looking elephant tusked guy. Um, but, you know, I didn't really get into his comics when I was so, that young because I, I didn't I didn't have a channel through which to do that. My my dad mm-hmm. didn't collect comics. My uncles mm-hmm. or friends didn't really know this character. Mm-hmm. So when I got older, I think I just accessed that memory and remembered, oh, yeah, I, I really love that guy. I'm, I was a fan of Swamp Thing as well. And I watched the Swamp Thing movie and the TV show where, I don't know if you remember, but the kid in the TV show was from Philadelphia. What? The Swamp Thing show. <laughs> oh, I never saw the show, no. Oh, it's rotten. Uh, but it's great. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Do you have a lot of swamps in Philadelphia? Uh, do we? I mean, I think people have said that Philadelphia is a swamp. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a fin or two. A sure, glade. Okay. Yeah, Ooh. Yeah, okay. We absolutely yeah. have a marshland or a fen. I'm sure we a, do. A flooded parking lot somewhere, mm-hmm. at least. You know, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so I I didn't really get into it until I was a little bit older and buying comics for myself. And uh, I remembered that I loved the man thing. I remember that card. And then I learned the, that meta context, that that hi- history, which I found very interesting. And the thing that, that stuck with me and the reason why I love him so much uh, apart from the way that he looks, his sad eyes, his weird, mm. like, rooted brow, mm. his, his features are just very interesting to me. But what I liked is just the, the question, the unanswerable question, like, why, why didn't he get popular? Mm. Like Swamp <laughs> Thing did, mm-hmm. you know? And I am the type of person who is very interested in the stories behind the publications. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, you know, there is a reason why the man thing was not taken up by Alan Moore. Alan Moore mm-hmm. wrote Saga of the Swamp Thing. Yeah, it's a big one. And fucking crushed it. It's incredible. Yep. And there's a reason why Alan Moore chose one over the other. And, and I've always been interested in the reasons why. And a lot of the reasons why, truth be told, is because people people at Marvel were just making truly awful decisions. His name is the <laughs> Man Thing. Like, it sucks. <laughs> I think one thing I really enjoy about Man Thing, especially in the 1974 comic that we read today, the fact that he can't speak. Yeah. You can have a lot more of that like dramatic old school, like uh, narrator style stuff happening Mm -hmm. uh, all around the panels. The narration was great in that 1974 one. Second person. Yeah. So fun. It was was like a very fun vibe for that. And then you go to the RL one and he somehow just absolutely <laughs> yeah. fucking oh boners it up. <laughs> yeah, it really sucks. But the thing <laughs> that like having a character who can't talk, uh, whose inner workings are a mystery even to... Even to themselves. Yeah. I, I, I think it's cool that basically he's just a, a force of kindness almost. Mm-hmm. Like right. all he can do is kind of help. Like he doesn't do a lot in the 1974 comic. It's mostly we're like we, we it's mostly hovering around fool killer who is absolutely amazing. And I can't wait to talk about him. We need, yeah, we should, we should start talking about this comic soon. Cause we got to talk about fool killer. Yeah. And I will, I will, I do just want to pause it. You know, the main, the main reason why I stick with, with this character and why I love this character so much is because he's such a softy. He yeah. has, his power yeah. is super empathy. He has like ultra radar I love for that. empathy. And, and the tragedy is that he cannot communicate back. So he, he understands better than anyone could ever understand 
what someone is going through, what they're feeling, what their what drives them from a like a chemical emotional sense, mm. and is he is completely restrained from communicating back. And I, you know, that, what a classic monster story, and I, I love that very much. But what if you got him like an etch a sketch? <laughs> uh, I'm glad you asked because that is covered in a comic. <laughs> Did they Good. put an etch a sketch Good. around his? If if someone puts an etch a sketch around his neck at some point, that would be probably that would be one of the best comics I've ever read. <laughs> that is weird that like his superpower is empathy, and I, I and he has trouble communicating because that is like the plot of a lot of like my favorite manga and anime is like mm. here's a here's a kid who just like cares a lot but he has trouble expressing himself mm-hmm. i i'm i'm drawn to that kind of story and this is it but it's here's a giant gross smelly monster who has uh super empathy and has trouble expressing himself but like i wish i had researched more uh before doing this podcast on man thing but um, what's the fear touch thing? Like, how does he set people on fire with fear or whatever? Like, what's you that? You know fear. You burn. <laughs> yeah, I can mean, you, there it is. Right? Can you explain wh- why and how? No, I mean, I, th- I think that, <laughs> I think that's it. You know, if you know fear, you burn. Um, you know, I, he, he's got to be scary in some way. And so I think the thing that is, this is part of the, the monsterness of it all, the classic, classic monster story mm. in his heart of hearts, you know, there's a, there's a dude inside of this monster husk, this guy that got transformed into this Ted Salas and in his heart of hearts, I don't think he would be aggressive or mean or anything, but mm-hmm. he is curious he is empathic he, he the character is so vacant uh, that yeah. he is a, he is a, a conduit to see other stories and behavior um and so the again the tragedy of the character is in spite of him not being aggressive or or uh, uh, a thrashing raving murderous monster he will cause people to be terrified it's just yeah. the nature of how he looks and he's a scary thing and uh, he has some chemical composition such that uh, like an acidic is, uh, is secretion uh, reacts to chemical of fear. I like the idea of a soul acid. That's just a fun way to think soul about acid, it. Soul acid, right. There's a diagram somewhere that they did a bunch of years ago, and it tries to explain his like fear bladder. And that's a fucking great <laughs> phrase. <Cool>. But <laughs> cool. He stores only so much at one time. <laughs> yeah. We don't really need we don't really need this. <laughs> I, I feel like Man Thing might also have been an inspiration for one of my favorite uh, TTRPGs, which is called Promethean. Shambling Mound? Shambling Sorry. Mound. That's Sorry, a real Kevin. thing. I make it you off. What were you going to say? Promethean. Promethean. Right? Yeah. Promethean. Yeah. What's Promethean? Uh, Promethean is a uh, white wolf game. So like they do Vampire the Masquerade and like Werewolf the Apocalypse and all those other like monster the whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, they did one called Promethean the Created and it's everybody's a Frankenstein. Yeah. You're just everyone's different crazy kinds of Frankenstein. Uh, but there's it. this mechanic in there where uh, you just cause... Uh, fear and disquiet in every like regular mortal person you're around and Mm so if you're like trying to like buy gas at a gas station you're on a clock until they go crazy and grab a pitchfork and try to stab you oh (laughs) so i like that they also provided a list of references in the book of like what inspired them to make the game and i i'm almost positive i saw man thing man dash thing in there and i was like what's that yeah, the man. I mean, I, I like that idea because with the man thing, you know, uh, Ted Salas was a scientist, and the scientist is driven by the, mm. an inquisitive nature, being curious, being an observer, and attempting. I mean, I'm not saying this as fact, but science is not neutral. But attempting to be neutral, um, mm. and uh, now that this scientist turned into a big old mossy monster man, he can't be those things because he yeah. elicits that response regardless of what it wants. Um, and I think that's interesting. Side note, can we talk about White Wolf games? Sure. Did you guys play the N64 um, WWF games? Oh, of course. Well, mm, I did no Mercy, WrestleMania yeah. 2000. Some of the greatest. I, the first time I ever learned about White Wolf games and um, uh, Vampire uh, Masquerade and, and that sort of stuff mm-hmm. was because they had to credit White Wolf in the beginning of those N64 video what? games. Um, because... Of Gangrel. Do you remember oh, this, Paul? No. Oh, shit. No, I don't remember Gangrel. What, go on. Gangrel <laughs> was the leader of the brood, which was Edge, Christian, oh, Gangrel, yes. in the WWF Attitude Era. Uh-huh. And 
they they just ripped that name. Yeah, that's from... a Vampire the Masquerade clan. Yeah. They're like they're like the wow. Beast clan. That, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I was so sick, and I remember always seeing that like that little nod to White Wolf. Whoa, like, oh, what's that? And that's the that's the connection game you play when you're a kid, in playing uh, N64 wrestling games, and you're like, oh, now I'm into horny vampire PC Sims. Cool, cool, Hell yeah, cool, cool, dude. Cool. Yeah, I mean that's the natural <laughs> natural progression through that. I'm sure it's the gateway of it. Yeah. No one's gonna no one's gonna understand this, but if they made a Malkavian wrestler, that'd be the coolest thing ever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> I don't I don't sue I kinda get it, but I support Kevin no matter what. I say I, I like the idea of a fantasy wrestler, Kevin, so I'm on board. Pa- Paul and I have to finish our playthrough of uh Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Oh, that's right. We started Ooh. that. Is that, that was... is that is that weird to play with a friend? Because isn't that kind of like a sexy game? You can get sexy with your friends, Chad. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Okay, yeah, I don't need to shame. You're right. Thank You're you. Right. It just Thank has you. like boobs and strippers in it, so it's like, I don't know, like it's Grand Theft Auto a weird game to play with your friends. I mean, going to see <laughs> going to see boobs and strippers in real life is I, a thing you do. I think if in Grand Theft Auto you you play with your friends and you just go and hang out in the strip club, yeah, that's weird. But otherwise, <laughs> what? Awesome. Well, then I had a lot of weird friends, Chad. <laughs> yeah, we I we probably shouldn't reveal how we're recording this episode. We all turned on GTA Vice City. Uh, we. <laughs> We're doing a little land <laughs> land party here uh, with Tommy Versetti and hanging out in a strip club. This is my Yule log, but I watch it year round. <laughs> <laughs> Love them pixelated boxy people dancing on the pole. Love That's watching right. it. Fourteen polygons, just having a good old time, gyrating. I, look, we're having a great time dancing around talking about these comics, but I do need to ask Adam one more question before we get into okay. this because we need some more, oh, just a tiny bit more context. Do you do you have any relationship with the books of Goosebump in your life? Like, do you, have you read them? Do you know R.L. Stein's work? You know, what, what's your vibe with all that? Yes, I do have a relationship with the books of the bump. I, I grew mm. up with Goosebumps, loved Goosebumps. I was a big fan of Fear Street. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I, which I, you know, I fancied myself a big kid because I was reading Fear Street. And I, I, I think for the same reason why I had some proclivity toward the man thing, there's just certain Goosebumps that I loved. I was a huge fan of the Monster Blood books. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Those were good. Yeah, you know, my, my mom was a librarian. So oh, cool. I spent a lot of time in the library in, in our elementary school. And Goosebumps were just one of those things that felt edgy as a kid mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you could get away with and somebody was happy that you were reading, even though it was <laughs> spooky, scary stuff. Uh, so yeah, big fan. In fact, when uh, it was announced that the Man Thing was getting a new series uh, in 2017, and R.L. Stein was attached, you know, a comic book people like to turn their nose up at this. You know, somebody's coming in from outside of the world, and how could they write a good comic book? I was stoked. I really <laughs> was because I, you know, I, yeah. I I think I had a generally in an unscathed good humor toward. Mr. Stein and um, I tweeted at him. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What did you say to him? I tweeted at him because when when Marvel releases advertisements for their upcoming books, they come out with uh-huh. these, these big thick books called like solicits. Mm-hmm. And uh, I in this in the solicits, they showed some key art, cover art. It's actually the cover art I think from issue three of this Man yeah. Thing series, and it's but not uh, the, with the words in it, right? As usual, not with the, the words in it. Do not have the words in it. Just yeah. the artwork, right? So you see Gabriel Peralta's artwork it looks pretty mm-hmm. cool, and yeah. the cover arts look cool, mm-hmm. and the artwork that they share one of the images was the man thing smoochin yep a yep. young lady yep. yep and i thought oh this is interesting and i i tweeted at mr stein and i said <laughs> uh mr stein respectfully uh, yep. the man thing ha- doesn't have a mouth it's actually said maybe in every single issue <laughs> um and uh i i you know jokingly i said uh-oh, uh-oh. uh so what's it like to kiss uh the man thing does he have a mouth or not and he responded to me in a curt fashion. Oh boy! And the tweets, the tweet said, "No mouth." <laughs> that was it. No okay. Mouth. Well, I guess he he passed the test. Yeah. Well, we should we should dive in. Do we? Yeah, I, let's do it. I I really want to talk about this 1974 comic, and we'll do it for as long as possible. <laughs> yeah. This is the Man Thing number four. This is the original first run. Is that right? 
This is actually, confusingly, not the original first run. Um, the the original, original book was called Savage Tales Number 1. There was the first appearance. Mm-hmm. And after that, he showed up in some mud- other books. Uh, you know, Kazar, the kind of like caveman-looking, um, yeah. Conan-looking guy? Okay. Uh, he showed yeah. up in Kazar's been playing, books. Play, been playing him in Marvel Snap. Shout out to Marvel Snap. Oh, yeah. Kazar and his cat, Zabu. And um, uh, and then he showed up in a series which was kind of a horror anthology called Adventure Into Fear. And he closed out Adventure Into Fear because he was so popular, they closed Adventure Into Fear and gave the Man-Thing his own book. So, uh, you know, whatever s- sequence that is, these are original books, but this was like not his first time around the block. This gotcha. was actually three years into him being on the scene. I saw okay. some letters in this issue of people being excited that Man Thing was getting his own uh, his own comic. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm glad someone else did too. I want to talk about those as well. Mail things, yeah. Mail things, yeah. I thought it was very cute, but this this one comes in hot. Man Thing, <laughs> yeah. Man Thing is dead. <laughs> Man Thing died. Up. Like he he got he got fragged real bad <laughs> right in his chest cavity. <laughs> uh, by Fool Killer, who is like the greatest character name of all time. I. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. He's like a Christian fundamentalist, oh extremist, faith healed monster. Zorro looking guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, I mean, this book is really more fool killers. I don't know if it's his origins, but it's just retelling us how he came to be. And man thinks man thinks there. It's like birth to death, a cradle to grave of fool killer. Yeah. <laughs> That is right. Yeah, is, is is right. Fool, has Fool Killer been uh, running amok before this book, or is or is it this is first? Well, appearance? he shot down the helicopter in the last book, I guess, <laughs> which has really caused this guy to be irate uh, with his with his purity ray. Or yeah, something. he was like, gun. helicopters are a front to God because only angels fly, and you shot him down. <laughs> it's not a biblically accurate helicopter. Is the problem? I think I, I love positioning Fool Killer as like this Christian like serial killer monster guy. Against Man Thing, who kind of, by contrast, inhabits like this sort of green man, like yeah, uh, like proto uh, Christian or like pre Christian, like, like a pagan, like religion. a pagan guy, you know, like a yeah, pagan god, like, sort mm-hmm, of. He's like mm-hmm. a pagan. He looks like a god. Quaker. Like he just looks like <laughs> some sort of. We finally hit those goddamn Quaker bastards back. Yeah, I got for him. But, but he has a space gun. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do want to just apologize. We're starting in media res here because, you know, the nature of comics is they, they want to sell the next book. And mm. I chose issue four, the man thing number four. And, you know, this immediately follows the events of man thing number three, <laughs> which introduces the threat of full killer. But oh, okay. I figured, you know, the goose butts, you can hang. Right. Oh, yeah. We, we, we can it out. start with the, your intro to the man thing, and the man thing is in fact dead. <laughs> uh, I figured we would get there together, and and I think we did. It was cool. You like really Tarantino'd us into this one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's so like I don't know. It, it it makes me think about how all the edge has been filed off of comics these days because like. We don't have comics about uh, like Kevin. This is code approved, so there's no edges to be worried about. <laughs> well, oh, well, I so mean, it's... this is about like the Vietnam War and like militarism <laughs> and Christianity in America, and like yes. we, yeah, we no, there's good stuff. We... There's good stuff. And it's there's... probably it's probably a standard thing that he had a ray gun and not just a gun with bullets that could also kill a man because he mostly fires at just men. Besides yeah. man thing taking one in the tum tum, like <laughs> he does. Well, he kills the helicopter pilot post yeah. haste. I mean, he just he just murks that guy the second immediately. Page, all he does, he says, is like that guy saved us, and I want to know why. And don't say anything about heaven. And he's like, "How dare you, you scoff at me and deny heaven in one breath, you fool!" And then and he, he kills and him. then he shoots him, and like the, the magic card uh, putrefy occurs in yep. this panel right here. <laughs> <laughs> that man is oh, this man is just dissolved pilot cannot regenerate no. <laughs> no. Yeah. he he suffered the wrath of the fool killer <laughs> and he just runs and leaves like innocence <laughs> in the swamp like he gets into his fucking ferrari and then he drives into his truck house yeah he's a sick car and he has the truck from spy hunter so he just cruises that <laughs> oh into yes the that's exactly what, amazing pull yeah his car oh, he yeah. calls his car his chariot too which is his chariot like, which is kind of that's kind of tarot so that that, okay. that might go okay. against the the chris the total christian anything although he's, re- he's reclaiming it he's re- he's taking it back yeah christians also like chariots they fucking so love I that guess, shit I, I well he works. calls him he i think the narrator 
you know, the unknown narrator calls it a chariot mm. uh, and uses quotation marks, yeah. which is, it seems to be the narrator, which is a little bit of a Greek chorus kind of situation yeah. mm. where they're like, this guy's a dick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, he jumps in his, his yeah. fire red chariot. The narrator doesn't know whether or not to comment on the Christianness of him. Like, he, like even the narrator's kind of walking on eggshells around that. <laughs> like, that's so fucking awesome. Yeah. What I what I really like about this fool killer, I mean, I, I hate him. I hate him with every fiber of my being. I He's the worst. But what I love about fool killer is, like you said, his car is just a car. It's like, every, besides the, the, the spectral, like purifying ray which they don't really get into how he made that here's the fun thing is that he didn't make it chad he bought it with the he with purchased the, it with church money with church yeah. money otherwise he's just a dude like i that's know that's right. obviously like well yes there's a lot of vigilantes but it's very clear he's just a guy who went insane and put a mask on and started shooting people he thinks is not religious enough and that's mm-hmm. kind of the most terrifying marvel villain i've read in years yeah. yes he has like the self assuredness of a character from like a mountain goat song, like an early <laughs> mountain goat song. <laughs> By the way, uh, the mountain goats, my my man, JD John Darnell, yeah, uh, did in fact write and release a song about the man thing what? in oh. 2018. What? Holy oh. shit! There's an EP. Uh, what is it? It's like uh, Infinite Hex or something. You know, some man- mountain goat shit. I love the mountain yeah, goats. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in 2018, uh, uh, on that album, there's the song for Ted Salas. And oh, I, awesome. I have been working toward getting JD on uh, Man Thing Minute. Uh, I don't know. It turns out he has more important things to do, like be on a TV show. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw Poker Face. But uh, yeah, I'm working on it. I'm trying to get him. Oh, man. I'm trying I to get it, him. I hope that happens for you. That's beautiful. I hope, I hope in no way does Goosebuds' association with you keep you from getting John <laughs> Uh, this is breathing guy. life into the desiccated body of the podcast, just like the man thing was revived <laughs> in the waters of the Citrusville swamp, Damn. like Jesus himself. I think we should get John Darnell onto Goosebumps. You should do the circuit, yeah, the I whole agree. man thing circuit. And then we'll be like, you know what? You should go on. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I I would take the alley oop, and I really appreciate that. It, whoever gets them first, yeah. alley oop them to this the is a one. This is a promise we have to make amongst ourselves right now. Yeah. I'm glad we're keeping this all on the recording. So <laughs> like, Manthing has, Man has risen from his shot. He resurrected. Yeah. yeah. And he just kind of like looks upon the other uh, scared helicopter patrons. And, and just, you know, he feels something. He feels their plight. They're a little scared of him, but they kind of think he understands, and he just walks away. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, the fool killer runs some hippies off the road. Yep, that's r- that's right. He runs well, and he runs off not just some hippies. He runs off the hippie Richard Rory, lifelong loser, and Ruth Hart, a quote unquote <laughs> biker chick. Wow, Ruth, yeah. even though she's dressed like Woodstock, so are, uh, are these like recurring Man Thing characters? <laughs> Richard Rory is one of the Man Thing's pals and shows okay. up a lot. So he was introduced in a previous issue, and he will continue coming back as a a buddy and a confidant uh, and protector for the Man Thing, an advocate. That makes me sad because he's a kind of a dickhead in this book. <laughs> It's he really is a dickhead. That, it's funny he you is say a he's a protect he's a protector because what while you're saying that I'm looking at the page where he's just clutching the wheel and he's like and he's here just to see me die and he's like screaming he's like this is not a man who has any sense of his thing together he's not soothing Ruth in any way who's being carried along towards her death with him he's screaming that we're gonna die everybody has that friend that you know you 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 deep down you love that friend but like you you also a little bit can't stand that guy right I I just hope my narrator doesn't describe me as a lifelong loser like, <laughs> like that would be a blowout. I don't think I could take. Yeah, that's true. So Richard Rory is a buddy. Ruth Hart, uh, she'll stick around for a little while, but she was rescued from this rogue of barbaric biker guys uh, in a previous issue uh, Mm. that preceded the full killer showing up. And, uh, you know, Rory just kind of like passes through these comics all the time and is often used as, um, let's, let's say, kind of a grounding uh, mm. beacon to mm-hmm. say like oh okay. this, this is where people are in proximity to one another okay um and uh and uh the man thing and rory understand each other because when they first met uh richard rory was contemplating suicide and ah. oh, as many characters are want to do in the man thing books in the 70s they go to the edge of the swamp in citrusville and they just think about closing it out 
Okay. And then the man thing shows up, okay. and he's like, hold on, man. And uh, hey, friendship don't do, don't do forms. Yeah. Damn. That's beautiful. Uh-huh. It's it's really disturbing stuff. Like, you have to imagine that Gerber was working through some stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like, to go to a swamp and be like, here's where I want to die. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It does sort of open up the question, like, what what exactly would have been the death at the edge of the swamp? Or is, is, is Man Thing capable of calling people who are in distress to him in some way? Oh, mm. that's, see, that's a, a siren call. That's interesting. Yeah. Where he can be like, hey, don't don't fucking kill yourself. Hey, hey. He goes, hey, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, knock it off. <laughs> yeah, just aside, I do, like, we kind of covered this. Man thing does always seem to have a a gentle giant, like, he's he's hairy in the Hendersons. He's just this big, big force force for good. Yeah, he's right? got those yeah. big sad yeah. eyes. Like you said, he's got puppy eyes. There's he's something, a cutie. There's something really cute about it. He's got a snuffleupagus nose, too. Yeah. He does have a snuffleupagus nose. <laughs> That's right. Um, can we talk about a little bit of the the fool killer. Uh, his yeah, his secret. The, you nailed it with the spy hunter truck. Oh well, there's the truck, the beautiful truck, which opens up. Uh, has the uh, preserved body of his pastor uh, idol inside of it. Yeah. Inside of a tube. just referred to as Mike, not Father Mike. Mike, Mike. Not you know Mike McCannican, just Mike. He lost the title of Pastor Mike when he did what he did. Yeah, we'll get there. He he canoodled. <laughs> How dare yeah. he canoodle? He had a money girl sit on his case. <laughs> he did have a money girl. <laughs> yeah, so we, let's say that. So, 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 uh, Fool Killer just starts like coming back to his base and he's like, I ran that guy off the road on purpose. I know who he is. I have more important things to do. Mike, Mike. And he starts <laughs> pounding the glass as his formaldehyde body and goes, Let me tell you, Mike, about how I became Fool Killer. Mm-hmm. My dad, he died in the war the day I was born. My mom died in the very next war. Commie bomb. The commie bomb. Yeah, that was. <laughs> That was some 70s shit right there. That's right. And I was born I was born in a in a wheelchair and my grandma ma let me just read military books all the time and then I found Christ. And yeah, here's how mm-hmm. you know he really took the wrong lesson from both of his parents dying in war. He was like Yeah. He didn't get he didn't get upset and mad at America for sacrificing his parents to the uh to the the grindstone of war. Instead he said, "Man, and well we should also note that he is in a wheelchair." And Mm -hmm. uh, he is upset because he will not be given the opportunity to sacrifice himself in the grinder of war like his parents did. That's Uh some nationalist brainwashing. Yeah, that is that is some messed up shit that's happening with full killer. Yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, mean, Gerber, he this is something that's expressed. There were a lot of the issues in the 70s is uh, Gerber's disdain for uh, the military, you know, American nationalism and that any form of that kind of dogmatic ideology is something that he he just will not tolerate. Mm -hmm. And he turns that all into this cartoonish, laughable, but genuinely frightening villain, which I I love because in its own right, it is lampooning comic books mm-hmm. in the comic book mm-hmm. you know yep. he just becomes a vigilante and is just an awful homicidal maniac in the name of god right uh, it's great this is pretty close to captain america's uh uh backstory almost like, definitely but but with a healthy dose of like christian zealotry <laughs> <laughs> a healthy yeah. dose I appreciate how they kind of like, so they, you know, they mentioned like, oh, well, he was in a wheelchair and he went to Reverend Mike's revival caravan and he laid his hands on me. And there's a really horrifying image of the the preacher's like, I have no mouth, but I must scream face. Yeah. Uh-huh. He has a scream yeah. face. Yeah. And like, yeah, he stands. They don't really get into, was it Christ? Was it magic? Was it? And he, he just got better. And so that gave you, know, I understand why this man now thinks uh, he has the power of God on his side. It was positive mm-hmm. thinking, Chad. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then he goes on a rampage against all of the fools who were holding signs uh, calling for peace. Uh, in, yeah, uh, he, he we cannot have that. We simply cannot have that. Uh, and he he decides that he can't just do it through talking. Nobody's listening to him. The way you know they don't realize how much he has, how much he wants to change. And the only way he can do it is by taking literally taking up arms. Uh, and that's when he discovers his uh, his his friend Pastor Mike hanging out with the money lady. Mm-hmm. Yep, this is a good comic book. This is a great comic book. Then while he, while he's re- doing the reminiscing about all this, uh, as someone smushes into Man Thing with a jeep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot about the smoosh scene. We, we gotta talk about the smoosh scene, but also just I just want when you say money lady, you money, it you is know, money just lady. it is. This is after a long set of like. 
showing that he had this long war to fight the criminals, the protesters, the dope pushers, mocking the Lord of the military, <laughs> basically just the hippies with the signs they need to go. Uh -huh. And Mike, he had a drink and a lady was sitting next to him and she was pretty and there was money on her lap. That's all he knows. Which is extra funny when you consider Jesus's like stance on Mary Magdalene and all that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. But but it, again, I think it's by it's a it's a it's a thing by the author being like you know this here's another Christian that doesn't understand like the the stories in the Bible at all or anything like mm -hmm. doesn't get any of the tolerance bits. Mike gets it. He mm -hmm. says, "Let loose a little bit. Have fun, yes. cool killer. Stop fighting the whole world." He says. In some ways, the comic wants you to see that uh, Mike was always a sham. He has a traveling Reverend Mike revival carnival. He's just making money. Right. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. uh, in some ways the the expression on his face while he's sitting in his room with that woman is, is he looks drunk. He's elated, that kind of thing. Um, but I could also read it a separate way, which is that, you know, he was just a man who had some balance. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Know. That's kind of how I'm taking it. Now, Same. now that we talk at first, I, I saw it more like you said, Adam, that it was that he was just like a, you know, like a huckster. Right. But now, yeah. like, as we talk about it, I'm kind of like, oh, maybe he's just a guy that sort of understands that you don't have to be, you know, far zealotry to be religious. The, the the comic never actually shows I mean, I would go on the limb and say that pretty much any revival is probably some level of a sham. It's a um, scheme. Right. Mm. It's a scheme, right? You're making money through, but but even it never really shows us having like showing Mike like, you know, spending the money on on booze or whatever, like or or, or betting on the horses. Like within a pa panel or two of a fool killer's, you know, rebirth where he can walk again, he considers himself the new messiah. And that mm -hmm. is way worse than anything <laughs> right. Mike does. Right. The, mm -hmm. the 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 money lady scene. I love calling her a money lady. <laughs> money so lady. The money lady scene it also puts a uh, fool killer in sort of a Holden Caulfield category of like <laughs> of like Mike yeah. is now the the phony and like uh, fool killer is the only you know true. He's the only one who's not a phony yet, man. He's the only one who's not a fucking hypocrite. And then the smoosh scene happens. Well, uh, just to be clear, uh, this sh the smoosh scene. Uh, <laughs> it's a squoosh yeah, scene, to be fair. Squoosh, yeah, sorry. right, you're right. Yeah. Um, it, the, the, the scene in that vehicle, there are, are several characters, and one of them is a, a man named Schist. Now, Schist is one of the primary villains in Man-Thing comics, and oh. his name in full is F.A. Schist, all right? Oh my oh. god! Oh my wow. god! I'm looking at it on the page, and it just like I the letters rearranged before my eyes. Holy I, shit! I didn't uh -huh. pick it up because when when the fool killer was like looking on his what I assume is his crime computer, it says Schist like, F.A. Yeah, Schist yeah. F.A. I was like, okay, so there's these three people that he came down here to to the Everglades to to hunt, and it's Roy mm -hmm. Richard. Ted, aka Man Thing, and the Schist guy. I was like, I don't know why. I don't know what the, what one of these guys is way stronger than the other two. I know that. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, well, the Man Thing fights fascism, and I I feel like he has never been a more relevant character ever, mm. ever, ever than right now. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah. Well, I'm glad RL captured all of that in the. <laughs> yeah, RL really captured the <laughs> radical empathy we need today. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this is what they call throwing the fight. <laughs> oh, oh my god, we are guys. We are 50 minutes into this podcast. We haven't even talked about the. RL we're not going to have much show. to say. We're not going to go through the full plot of the. RL I one. thought we were going to go beat by beat. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can, we can burn right into it because at this point in in this 70s comic in 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 Man Thing number four, we we get what's happening here, right? Yeah, right. You know, you 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 have a sense of the character of the Man Thing. You have a sense of the kind of comic. This is one of flavor of a Man Thing comic. There are several. Mm. Some are more horror focused. Some are more about uh, um, social issues. And the Man-Thing is almost always used as a vessel to view people's behavior during whatever circumstances. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You know, these comics deal with uh, uh, dogmatic ideology. They deal with racism and police mm -hmm. uh, uh, abuse. Mm -hmm. They deal with uh, all manner of different things. And it constantly is critical. Gerber is critical of, you know, the war and, and uh, uh, proto-military, you know, uh, state all that stuff. So you get it. It's silly. It's campy. It's comic books, but it has an undercurrent. There's something happening there. And then totally. 2017, Stein, 
like how did we get here? Ugh. And I I have some theories. Well, so I I do, there were two two points I wanted to make about the comic. One was uh, Rory's scene in the diner. The man yes, who gives please. him the gas. I just need to say this. You get the man who gave him the gas. He, he points out as he goes, "Oh, hello! It is the man who gave me the gas that saved my life." And then he goes, "What brings you to this place? Was your country club co- closed?" Or and then he's like talking shit on this guy. He's like he's just like starting shit with him. Then he fucking takes a swing at him because he sees his red car and starts beating the crap out of this guy. And then the then the the fool killer does show up and uh, tries to run him over with a car. There, there are there are so many white dudes with long brown hair in here yeah. that they all get confused on who each other is and starts punching. <laughs> them. That's, that's a good yeah. point. That's a great point. I got confused. They got confused. Everyone's confused. Uh, I, I love when fool killer. I know we, fool killer crashes that diner. There is an amazingly drawn panel of the truck coming through and bodies and flying. Chicken. Yeah. Yeah, bi- biker chick going, Richard, Richard, look out. His brakes must have failed. Or, no, I can see it on his face. He did <laughs> yeah. this on purpose. <laughs> this guy's crazy. <laughs> that, was a, yeah, that was a great moment. And then we'll, we're going to get right into 2017. But so ultimately, Man Thing does sneak up on on uh, Fool Killer and Rory <laughs> as they're having a showdown. Uh, and he, yeah. he, he fears Fool Killer to death. Um, well, sorry, he fe- just touches him. He just touches him. He t- he fears him, and then Fool Killer, in his, in his panic, uh, as Roy tries to t- disarm him, fires off his purifying uh, ray, which shatters Mike's glass of his of his thing of his Father uh, Mike. Uh, Father Mike of his of his uh, case, and the the glass flies everywhere, including into uh, Fool Killer's heart, where he falls over. And there is a line. There's a closing line that that I want to yeah. read. What a lousy way to die, even for a killer. But maybe it's poetic justice, sort of, even if we never know what the rhyme was. Now, I had to write that line down because I knew we would never get anything even close to that level of quality <laughs> in the upcoming book. And boy, was I right. What yeah. do you mean, Paul? What specifically do you mean? We have master craftsmen <laughs> of all <else> time. <sighs> Okay. Uh, can I mean, like, can you guys offer some apologetics here? Like, how did does Stein write other comics? First of all, hmm. are, are there uh, other comics? I'm, I'm looking, sure he has. I looked this up. He has. He has written comics of his books. I don't think he's written any other comics. Okay. <laughs> At least up to when Man Thing came out, he had only written comics of his books. And this has gotten like hyped a lot, even before you talk about you're getting excited when it came out. We also were like our our Discord for Goosebuds was like sharing the covers. Like, oh my god, are else going to do Man Thing? Like, right. I, I, I had this on my pull list, and then as the preview pages came out, I went, no, thank you. And I took it off my pull list. <laughs> I saw the shoe size joke, and I was like, don't need to don't need to read that anytime soon. <laughs> RL doesn't even seem happy that he got Man-Thing to write, because he, he refers to him as a garbage heap of a character in his intro. Yeah, I yeah. wrote that line down as like, a, I was like, is he like, is there something I'm missing here? Is that like a, like a loving reference to something? But I truly believe, because he talks about how he liked horror comics in his opening letter of his book, and then he does not say anything about liking Man Thing. He just says, he says so nothing I got- about a Marvel property. Even he's like, I liked EC Comics, which were a different thing. EC, yeah, yeah. The best thing I can say about this is you could read it as just a skewering of Whedonism quip, like, true quip dialogue. Okay, over that's fair. Everything. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even think it's fair to. I'm not going to defend Whedon or anything, but I don't even think like these are worth calling quips. Like, <laughs> this is <laughs> they aren't jokes, Chad. This is R.L. Stein's bathroom reader. I, <laughs> yeah, this, this comic reading through it made me wonder: Does R.L. even fucking like horror? Genuinely, I thought that too. Well, we know about Arl over the entire course of of his career that he was jovial Bob Stein. He wrote bathroom readers. He he liked to do wacky wacky yoke, yak jokes, and then the series Goosebumps happened to take off. I'm just like, is he just like chained to the horror genre and doesn't want to? <laughs> because he, like you said, he has this long di- you know opening about how much he loved comics were important for all the kids, and I liked DC Comics. And then proceeds to do nothing horror in this. Like <laughs> it's just Man Thing makes jokes. He's he's like the Prometheus of of kids <laughs> horror. And instead of a, a a giant mythical bird eating his guts out every day, uh-huh. he's just churning out this absolute dog shit. <laughs> Scholastics in his liver with a spoon every day, just <laughs> <laughs> sucking that juice out. I, well, I, I did. I love that this opens up too. And now that you said that you love Godzilla, Adam, 
I love that this opens up with like potentially a, like a big monster fight, and then it just spoils that entire thing. Classic RL fakeout right at the beginning. It's like, oh, here's a here's a twist in the first couple of even. <laughs> and uh, Adam, I don't know how recently you've read a uh, Goosebumps book, but one thing that we that we've noticed that he loves to do is he loves to have his characters be stuck in a situation where they have to think of something to do, and the only thing they can think of is. <laughs> What should I do? What should I do? Literally, but page one of this book ends yeah. with him doing that in that moment. The, uh, okay, so that's a trope. That's a trope. It's, this is filled. This is chalk full. It, it, but it can't, it can't even stick to what this this trope then sets up. So it's like, yeah, first two pages. Oh, he's facing down the silver centipede. Don't know if that's a Marvel character I've ever heard of. Uh, doesn't matter because it turns out uh, it's all on a movie set. And there was an earlier joke where our man thing like he wishes he had a script right. to know what was going on next. Like, oh, is he fourth wall breaking? Well, he is, but not yet, because this is a Hollywood set. And Man Thing is an actor in a monster movie, but also works in the Hollywood industry in Burbank, where he can talk and he has an agent and they don't like him in the movies. I was very confused by this entire But process. it turns out that doesn't matter. No, it do, it does not matter. It doesn't, but it does matter that the it wasn't his agent actually. It's a development director named Heck Haywood, which is a sick name. <laughs> yeah. a sick name. It is a good name. I do like Heck Haywood. In fact, I would say Heck gets the only good lines. Which in one? This. Uh, like his his goofs that he does on him. Uh, yeah, hey, you know, Marvel used to do these parody books. I don't know if they still do them, but they're basically their version of Mad Magazine. And what were they called? Like Strange Tales or or mm. Weird Tales or something like that. And this would fit beautifully in one of those because that the the intention there is just to poke fun, right? Just to be silly. Sure. And this is I'm not being the guy who is saying like, oh, but this isn't canon. It just it doesn't it doesn't share any DNA at all with the character it makes no sense it no. could be absolutely any character at all and i imagine you know to some people man thing is so d-list like who who cares who who would be loyal to the 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 character background but uh you know you know there were there was something we just read that book in the 70s that that meant something even at its campiest at, adam i read that book that was the first man thing i ever read and i was insulted within five pages of this book <laughs> <laughs> this, this really is an offensive book to the reader not offensive and it like is. oh there's inappropriate stuff. Yeah. this is like i don't think rl likes writing guys i don't know like this is <laughs> <laughs> what a here's a game. What age range is this for? Wow. Yeah, exactly. Wow. wow. Yeah. I don't know. It's marketed at maybe seven year olds who have heard of goosebumps from their dad. I don't know. <laughs> well, because there are jokes in here like uh, Stein references things oh my God. that he is catching wind of in 2017 like or 2016 or whenever he was writing it. So he's referencing things like trends on social media. He references throwback Thursday. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know like he's tossing social media lingo in there. And in fairness, this was six years ago. Stein was a younger man. He was 72. <laughs> he says major fail at one point. Major epic fail. fail. <laughs> Yeah. But also, but also, he's using the young lingo that the Zoomers use before he even knew the term Zoomers. But also, in that same issue, there's a joke where he's at a bar and someone's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm the good humor man. And I'm like, that's, that's a insane. joke that I don't yeah. even know what that is. And I had to look it up. That's an ice cream man from 1950. That's yeah. something Bugs yeah. fucking Bunny says. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> like, did, did you guys, did you guys all read the the short vignette comics at the end? No, uh, I scanned them. I, okay. I was really, I was really losing hope. Every issue has an additional, very brief horror comic, also by R.L. Stein. Okay, uh, and they are very adult, very weird, really fucked up, and they completely defy whatever age range you might have had evidence to go on that these bad jokes were for, mm -hmm. because they all end in like violence against women, like really wild Ew. stuff. Wow. Oh. There was some casual misogyny in the origin story of uh of Ted. There sure was. So unfortunately Ted. that is uh canonical. <laughs> <laughs> gonna ask how how close that was to the actual origin of man thing so he really yep. he comes up with a super soldier serum doesn't want the military to get a hold of it so jabs himself and falls into a lake 
Yeah, it gets a lot worse because in the original, I mean, in the original was a horror comic. And so all the tropes yeah. that come with horror, you know, you have a beautiful woman who is naked throughout most of it. Right. And she, sure. You know, is uh, violence happens to her. So his his wife at the time, they've never officially been annulled. So still married. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, after he turns into the man thing, uh, he comes back for revenge and burns her face off. She oh. survives. Oh, oh boy. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, like boy. accidentally burns. Like he's like, let me touch your face. And then uh, no, no, and not accidentally. Oh. Like, oh, like, no. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, but, you know, that was like black and white, truly gorgeous, but horrifying, grotesque comics in the 70s. And those were in that, that first story debuted in a, a magazine which was for adults not mm. a comic book it was like you you had boobs and blood and all that stuff because of the comics code they had to release that stuff in a, a horror adult magazine gotcha. that's where the man thing came from so his origin you know fits the genre for better or for worse sure you're, you're and i want i want to know by the way because i'm, I'm kind of scanning across these vignettes that were at the back of this collection i, w- I wish now i had read at least issue one and two's you know fucked up stories each with different artists which to me is always like oh this were these were written by a different person because a different artist had to do these eight pages for a different deadline yeah i'm going to guess i noticed in the credits of the book that the the main storyline was credited as written by rl stein and then the rest of them didn't have an author credited these all start with a tale from rl stein's chamber of chills it seems like a dance around that he didn't write these i'm just gonna throw it out there that these are Ghost writers. Uh, I, maybe, maybe you are correct, but let me just toss this your way, and you tell me how it how it strikes you. In the first issue, the the comic at the back of the first issue is about a magical cursed ring. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh. So, I mean, it sounds sounds pretty Stein. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And the one thing that really bums me out more than anything else is the artist on this first comic is Daniel Johnson. And if you read comics now, you now know that he goes by Daniel Warren Johnson, and he is truly one of the greatest uh, writer and artists on the map. He's just absolutely incredible, Mm -hmm. and his talent is purely the artist the art is so good in these it's one of the reasons why i was was like when i saw the previous stuff i was like this sounds great sign me up and then people started to post the epic fail my shoes should be in size 142 or whatever (laughs) and like that's such a shame and the artist you just take the gig i'm sure it was probably had a blast some of these some of these pages some of these covers are fantastic for man thing we kind of we kind of have mentioned different parts of this for those who aren't reading these issues and i'm so glad you're not reading these this like for an issue, these stories jump all over the fucking place. We have that's the thing about it is like I felt like I was on drugs while I was reading this, where I was just like <laughs> I was just like reading in not a fun way, but a bad way. Uh, this was worse than Goosebumps. This it, yeah, like, these are worse whoa. than Goosebumps. It, it's fucking wild, Adam. It's it's wild that he can just have so like the beginning is like all right, he's in the Hollywood system, he's not happy, and he reminiscing about how he got here, right? Okay, we can jump around a little bit. But then we're back in Burbank and he's trying to get a drink at a bar, but he doesn't isn't allowed in. And then another man thing shows up and they mm-hmm. get in a fight and eventually he is uh, con- consumed by the other man thing, subsumed. He's I don't know, he's just sucked inside of him. And then they're just dropping through the sky into a swamp. They teleport presumably through the nexus without saying it's the nexus. I guess, yeah, they just yeah. go back to the swamp. And sure. then classic RL animal slander. He's attacked by vultures who are not <laughs> swamp dwelling creatures and bats and stuff. He, and- he even but the, the stakes. There's no stakes in this comic at all. Like even when he's attacked by vultures and and bats because they're drawn like bats. Uh, uh, he's like these. They can't really hurt me, but this could get annoying. He keeps saying that. <laughs> he keeps saying that even when he's being shot by machine guns, about that he cannot be hurt or feel pain. Like cool. Thanks. Thanks. I'm on the edge of my seat if man thing's gonna make it through this. And we haven't mentioned this explicitly, but throughout the entire comic, both comics, all of all five of these issues all together, he's just quipping and and making Bugs Bunny jokes. Yep. And yep. They're not even Bugs, but that's insulting to Bugs Bunny. It is yeah. insulting. They, like it is it's just absolute drivel humor. 
And the thing is, is the man thing, for those at home who haven't grokked this, can't think, like can't speak, doesn't even think in the, in man thing number four when asked for help. He has to, the, the narrator goes out of their way to say, he's got to try to figure out what that means. Right. He's a primal <laughs> force. Yeah. He can feel that they need help, but he doesn't know what help means. Yeah, right. That's why it's, that's why it's so astounding that it felt like, oh, R, I was like, did someone, did RL pitch this or did like. They're like, or, or, you know, Man-Thing needs a shot in the arm. You know you know how we have, like, Deadpool and everyone loves Deadpool? What if Man-Thing cracked jokes? And it was written by a 70-year-old man. I, I... And, and the other thing about that, too, Chad, is it's not even just Man-Thing. Every character. Everyone. Yeah. The villains. And, like, the, I was ugh. I was so, I was hurt by the fact that the two people who show up to <laughs> rob him of the serum, like, can't even... <laughs> Can't even take their damn impending death seriously. I, dude, yeah. I He's, didn't bring my uh, swimsuit. Yeah. I Just, gotta call my optometrist. Yeah, while Manley's lifting the car over to kill him, he's like, oh, no, my trunks. Yeah, exactly. Like, Feel the fear. Feel the fear you're supposed to be feeling right now. I saved a few of these for the listener to know just how bad these jokes are, and it is just the sheer volume of them. Mm -hmm. Ariel doesn't, like, write a bunch out and then pick his favorite one. He gives you all of them. He won't shut the fuck up in this (laughs) Mm -hmm. comic. Like, Silver Centipede in the first first page or two... Uh, the caption goes, as Man Thing hesitates, the centipede taunts him, a barrage of cheap insults designed to demean and demoralize. God. Whoa, I didn't know they could pile human waste that high. Where does the swamp end and you begin? Think you're attractive just because you attract flies? Here's a newsflash. They have this new thing called deodorant. One more. Get back to the swamp. <laughs> There's a gator waiting for his breakfast. Like, These what is are that? all awful. They're not even... <laughs> like... Just pick one, and my brain could have maybe moved on. They're not even grown worthy. They're no. not even Ugh. like dad joke grown worthy. <laughs> like ah, uh, wordplay. It's not even that. Yeah. It's just mean. It's just mean insults that he's throwing at. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my yeah. You know, my main problem is they're just mean. He's just being mean. I don't like, and I know that swamp. That I must come swamp thing. And I know that man thing uh, feels it very hard. He's 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 feeling the like, the anger and the and the the bulliness of it. It just he's you can tell he's real sad. He's already sad. And, uh. Paul was about to say Swamp Thing, and then he felt the nudge of my purifier gun under the desk. <laughs> I felt it go against my neck. You fool! Uh, by the way, uh, I just want to like put a cap on it. I th- I'm going to start saying fool all the time now. Yeah. Every, like fool yeah. is back in in a big way. I think R.L. should maybe watch his back in case Fool Killer survived that flex again. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> He's being rather foolish. Uh, there was a detail in this story that I could tell was uh, I scrolled a little bit through the rest of the issues. We only really covered issues one and two for this, but you know, tangentially, we're going the and can't believe this issue. They stopped this at issue five or six. Can't believe people didn't buy this comic. Yeah. The big arc that R.L. was setting up is that after he's teleported back to the swamp, even though he's reabsorbed his beastly side, there's no change to what he is other than he can only talk now? Or he can only think. I guess that's the change. He's like, oh no, the swamp's all all messed up. Old father, the guardian of the swamp, must be... No, old father. Old father. Old father. And I'm guessing this is, you know, that's built in the lore. He didn't invent old father. But his no, old that father, is invented. It's invented. Really? Was, that is invented. I was wondering about the old father with his uh, ma- with his matrix den in the middle of the swamp. <laughs> so, yeah, fully yeah. manufactured. Wow. Oh my god! I thought at no least like father. he was paying off some part of the lore or something. Like, oh, Shazam's got his old wizard guy. Like, this is what's so goofy about it too. And and I I really want to exercise some patience here because this is a new comic. Like somebody picked this up and this was their first look into the man thing. And you know, there's some aspects of it that maybe somebody likes because you know, I don't know. The man sure. thing is just interesting to look at, but. <laughs> Uh, old father is interesting because in this comic he is taking the place of a character that does in fact exist uh. and that character is named Darkeem and Darkeem is a like a wizard a magic wizard who is very buddy buddy with the man thing in fact it's a little odd because Darkeem has a a sense of humor that is very silly and it feels out of place for man thing comics Mm -hmm. but because the man thing is connected to the multiverse a lot of characters that come through the multiverse and interact with him are representative of other comic genres Mm. and darkeem is silly 
or a Dakim, I'm sorry. Dakim is silly. He's jokey. He has uh, uh, an attitude that is lighter and stranger. It annoyed mm. the editors at Marvel that he was in a horror comic. Like, what is this guy mm. doing? Why is he in a horror comic? And so that attitude, that character, that background is transposed and in, in used in a new character, Old Father. I don't know why you don't just tap the well that exists, right? Like, right. Just use Dakim. Dakim is right there. Yeah, just use that guy. He he does the same shit. I, I mean, you'd hope the Marvel editor would have been like, "Hey, we have this thing. We know the comics, but also, I, I don't know." I, I think the Mar in this case, yeah. I I think in this case, the editor of this miniseries walked himself to the edge of the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> And he sat down against a tree and he was like, I don't know about all this. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, it, it, it's like, Paul, I know you were hitting on it too. It is so fucking funny, this image of the, the mystical old father. And then it cuts to, yeah, like someone's basement den in the swamp. So there's like vines. Someone's gaming chair. And then like, like big LEDs and a gaming chair and like a, a Microsoft Surface tablet. He was like, yeah, like he was, I did an office redesign, guys. Check out my office redesign. I got, I got, a, I got a vertical monitor for Twitter. You he's know? just... He's just dragging icons of birds or something. Like, what is he fucking doing? But you guys are writing something funnier than what's on the page. Because if Old Father turned his TVs on and said, Hey, guys, I'm here again. So good to see my old heads hanging out. Make sure you smash that like button. You know, like, if there was if there was something in there, if, the, if there was consistency of the gag, right. even. Like, Man Thing comes back, and he's, like, doing his YouTube sh sh spiel, and he's like, Get in on this YouTube game with me, man. Thing we can get up, we'll get some money. Man, thinks like, no, I'm only doing old media, dude. I do not do new media. He's like, dude, I'm about to announce my new branding. No, I'm not. I'm ditching to Keem. I'm I'm going straight. I'm up going old, old father. father. Old, old father. <laughs> old father is his gamer tag. It's a it's a zero at the end of the name. I like that. That'd be so much better. It oh. would be okay if if the if this book committed to the bit mm. and the, it can't commit to the bit because there are 2000 bits on every page. Right. And it's one thing for me to say, all right, well, this is, this is the take, this is the interpretation. And it's just not the one that vibes with me. This is so all over the place. It's too, it's too hard to, to grapple with any of it in particular. It's just kind of nothing. As, as usual, I'm left wishing RL was either more or less comfortable with himself. <laughs> I don't know which way would fix things. I, I read ahead through some of the issues. I was like, I kind of want to know what was our, what is RL doing? Because we end issue two with he goes to the Nexus door and I'm like, hey, where will he'll follow the old father's missing? I'm like, wow, that's really... Wish we had started with this than just half a page in Burbank, but whatever. <laughs> it seems like the rest of this miniseries that I assume, Adam, you read the whole thing of uh, uh -huh. is like could be good with a good writer going through the nexus of all realities to some sort of interdimensional galactic war. And well, I was scanning through this and it's a classic RL moment. I had to just see like some things that happened. And in a classic moment, you know, like writing one one oh one, right? You want your ca your character should always be the agent that pushes their story forward, right? Through their actions, the the plot should progress. They should never have things just happen to them, right? And if things do just happen to them, they should be through some decisions that they've made. And like in this, I was re I don't I didn't read it. I just looked through it and scanned through it. But there's a fight with a giant gladiator, and he somehow he demand things during the fight. I don't know what happens that causes him to do it, but ultimately he turns back into his human self. And the gladiator won't kill him because he's too puny. And then the gladiator kills himself because it would That's be right. a, a dishonorable thing to, to kill him. So not he doesn't even save himself in this fight. He's saved because of some other character's choice and action. And it's just that is some that is some stuff that happens in a Goosebumps book that oh that's the stuff that we always complain about right yep. yeah yeah no no I mean also I I feel like the this is not canon or if it is it's not respecting any of it the idea that Man Thing can now resort back to his human form to tell stories about kissing ladies seems antithetical to what man thing is I, I, <laughs> uh, clearly that's a thing in a lot of comics right like bruce banner and he turns into the hulk and you have the duality but like part of the tragedy of man thing is he's trapped in that and to just take that away makes me like feel even less agency over man thing in a weird way 
maybe he was setting up an arc or something. I don't know because I I only read the requisite amount I was asked to read, and Good then man. I <laughs> closed the tab as fast as possible. Healthy but, approach, but um. But maybe, like, if I'm being generous, like, maybe he was setting up an arc where, he's, where he realizes it's good to be Man-Thing. But all this reads is that, like, RL's like, well, why didn't I get Spider-Man? Yeah. <laughs> well, the last, the reason I mentioned all of this is the last page of what I presume was RL assuming he's going to get more issues uh, was he finally jumps through the Nexus. Old Father is, like, a disembodied head. I, like, very much a uh, God of War's uh, Amir. Mm-hmm. And then he goes through a portal and the last page is just he's in the suburbs of a of a neighborhood where everyone are man things. That's right. That's a that's a goosebumps and ending right that there. That is a classic goosebumps ending. And the last yeah. line is someone mowing the lawn going a man thing going there go the property value. Because another man thing showed up. Man, it's a whole town. What a does whole that even sub- mean? Suburbia. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. None of us. I mean, there's no way. There's simply no way to know. I mean, in a way, it's borderline alluding to racism. <laughs> like maybe <laughs> another species shows up in your town and then you say, there goes the property. Like, what were you alluding to? Why would that be referential and people would find that funny or familiar? Right. Something awful, actually. Right. So I don't know. It's just, I don't, I don't know what to make of this book. And it was such a, here's the bummer of it all. If you if you know how comics are released, how they're they're uh, written and then released, you know they come out uh, every other week if you're lucky. But for the most part, you're waiting almost like a month mm-hmm. between yeah. issues. And if you are someone like me, you are starved for content featuring my favorite guy. You know, they, there's not a lot of content out there, not a lot of good comics at all, not a lot of comics, let alone good ones. Mm-hmm. And I bought all of these and. Gentlemen, it didn't make me feel good. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. I mean, maybe they're collector's editions now. I don't know. And the entire time I'm reading them thinking, gosh, this is just awful. You know, it's like downing something you don't want to have, but you 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 feel compelled to for some reason. Mm-hmm. And then at the very end of it, my takeaway is this won't sell. People won't like it. Man thing's never coming back. Oh, no. Yeah. No, there's a Marvel editor somewhere going, well, no one likes Man thing back in the vault, you know. We threw our best celebrity writer at it and it yeah. didn't work. So that's it for me. Who would have been a worse one though? I mean, like I'm trying to see the brighter side. Who mm. who would have been who would have been a worse a celebrity writer on a man thing book? Uh JJ Abrams' the son. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I. I listen. I might burn bridges with J.J. Abrams as a career. I, I'm, Adam, I'm sure you know about that Spider-Man co- book a couple years ago. Yeah, J.J. <laughs> Abrams was just doing a video. We uh, wrote a Spider-Man book, and it's That's like J.J. Right. Abrams and his what twelve-year-old son or uh-huh. whatever wrote this book. It it was hot garbage, and they also like brag in the promotional video that Marvel's editors had been like hunting after jj abrams's son for years in a weird way like why are you scouting a 12 year old yeah since he was eight they're like yeah, this guy's got the gift we can tell <laughs> he's got the gift of writing I'm like cool right. cool nepo baby the comic book like it was yeah um, <laughs> uh yeah i don't think it could get worse i'll just say that mm. i think i think we hit the bottom yeah i think you might be right i think you might be right Listen, R.L. Stein has written stuff that we've liked. He has. He has. It's it's in it. There's something in there that he can do it. Well, actually, we don't know that. For, <laughs> now that I say it, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I see Pinkman going, he can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Books with his name have been good. I don't know that he's written yeah. them, but, but it, see, seemingly he has written good things. So we can assume... <laughs> There is a version of R.L. Stein that can write a good man thing book, but the, he did not bring that to this. I don't think you can get a good R.L. Stein book by asking him to be R.L. Stein and be true to himself. Someone clearly is like, we want all the R.L. Stein flavor. And he's like, you got it. Here's what I got. And this is unmistakably extremely R.L. Stein. If like we managed to beat R.L. Stein down enough that he had some humility <laughs> and some shame and we gave him a, a, a long amount of time but a harsh deadline, I think perhaps we could get a normal fucking story out if of If we him. said, R.L., you have to write this book or you don't get to write any more books, maybe we would have gotten something from him. No, I no, no. That's the end of a Twilight Zone episode and he would say, I'm free! <laughs> 
<laughs> That's <laughs> true. That's true. Run it down the landscape toward the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> well, his, his end of his Twilight Zone episode would also then be like, didn't you know we're all made of balloons? And they just like, <laughs> they float away. There goes the property value. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Adam, like, thank you for bringing your knowledge of Man Thing and sharing these I- incredibly cursed comics to our attention. Yes, thank you. Do you, you guys so normally apologize at the end of your um, podcast? Because I feel I feel compelled. I just want to say sorry to to uh, each of you, Kevin. I'm sorry, Paul. Oh, Adam. I'm sorry, Chad. I'm really sorry, Adam. We 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 both went through a traumatic experience together. There can be no apologies. <laughs> yeah, we just, uh, we're we're bonded through this. Do you feel that you have? gotten a name a, nick, a nickname for yourself oh yeah you know i i guess i'm, I'm looking at this one issue of in which uh man thing is smooching this this lovely dame <laughs> and uh and i think uh, i'm thinking back to the first issue that we started with so i feel like i want to call myself the full kisser <gasps> wow yeah okay it's that's written, beautiful it's so, written in the book. that's beautiful so it is written we need that radical empathy so all the fools can be redeemed <laughs> that's right you fool <laughs> well, well, fool kisser, uh, maggot freak, um, maggot freak. Dunk tank was Chad. Dunk, dunk <laughs> tank was me. Yeah, and PB Crisp is Kevin. And PB Crisp, the, the bit everyone expected to last episodes and episodes and episodes. <laughs> We're keeping it going. Uh, shit, that's been a that's been a fun goose goose time <laughs> that's been a good goose time hey uh oh, paul i feel like you're about to do it yeah you i was gonna say adam, adam where can people find you on the internet oh yeah uh you can follow you know um, i have a difficult relationship with the bird app these days but i'm there mm, yeah. Mm, uh, yeah you can find me on twitter adam tetris that's uh t-e-t-e-r-u-s and you can follow my podcast man thing minute uh, which is available wherever you find podcasts. Uh, we are currently doing a little bit of a rebrand hiatus. So when we return, the show will have a new title. We have a, an amazing roster of guests. JD uh, of the Mountain Goats, you are formally invited. Do you listen to the pod? I hope. I hope in you Citrusville, here. yeah, John Darnielle, thank you for your five stars. And <laughs> JD, you're also formally invited on here on Goosebuds. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. and uh, JD, you should also be on uh, the Doughboys and the Criminal podcast. I like Criminal too. <laughs> Nice. And you're also invited to write a man thing comic. Uh, yes, if anybody would do it, I think it was him. <laughs> oh, I invite I everyone that. to listen to the Mountain Goats 2018 uh, song for Ted Salas. It's a great little ditty. I'm going to listen oh, yeah. to that after this recording. Adam, thank you so much for being part of it. For all of you listening, uh, especially anyone who maybe has joined us uh, via Adam to this episode, uh, we have done a lot of these episodes of Goosebuds, and you might be like, I've listened to all 144. I'm, I want more. Well, wouldn't you know, you can go to our Patreon and get access to bonus monthly episodes called Camp Goose Buds, where we hang around the digital campfire and kind of talk about other things related to the books. Sometimes we talk about comic books, video games, uh, game development, um, politics, balloons in the air. I don't know. All sorts of things. This is the worst promo I've ever done for Camp Goose Buds. <laughs> no, I like go it. Patri- good. Thank you. <laughs> you can also vote on other things <laughs> that we're going to cover on the show and get access to our Discord, which is first heralded the announcement of these titular man thing comics by rl stein you can go to patreon.com slash goosebuds to pledge your support nice i also have a thing to promote go ahead go ahead, do your thing yeah kevin uh uh hi i'm kevin i've been this voice talking into the microphone do you do you want to join a game jam well i've got one it's it's called the super Trag grab bag jam and it's going on right now <laughs> starts right now it's going on right now <laughs> Uh, you can go on to jam.supertrystudios.com uh, if you want to check out the jam. It's going for two months, uh, so February and March this year of 2023. Um, I'm making a game for it as well as running it. It's not a competitive jam. You don't even have to make a video game if you just want to make art under some like fun constraints and hang out. Uh, you can do that. Uh, uh, I just did a video where I brainstormed with the themes for the jam and I got kind of an idea of what kind of game I'm making. So if you want to check that out, uh, check out jam.supertrystudios.com. Uh, if, if you've been listening to me for a while and you like my stuff, uh, and you think I'm good, maybe check out givekevinmoney.com and and give me a dollar or something that would really help. And, uh, thanks for listening to goose goose buds. I I appreciate it. Uh, I have nothing to promote and I'm just going to say, go read an old man thing and then go give man thing minute a listen. All right. Adam, thank you once again. Thank you very much. I, I, it was the pleasure is mine. Well, 
It was painful a little bit, but the pleasure is mine. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Fool Kisser. This episode of Goosebuds is brought to you by our fantastic Patreon supporters, those who have pledged a special level will be immortalized forever in the digital age in the Book of Names. The Book of Names. Book of Names. Starting with Stepin Jive Turkey Kuwabara. Hollis Hornbeak. Low Belly Hate Me. Cameron Murphy Audio. Michael McDowell. Hey Josh Rob. Mickey C. Nathan Dolezal. Kelly C. Mike Lanteri. Buddy Morrill. Elkade. Mel Dipson. Afshin. Brian Wells. Zentacles pledges his tentacles to Chad and his dog friends. I got another one. Are there eight of them? Let's hope there's at least eight tentacles. Yeah. Stealth Bates. Robert Moon. Jason Crooker. Clay Castle. Miguel Pardo. John Keedy. Calf. New paranoia shop about quicksand out now. No, there's not, but thank you. Adrian Rosas. Gregory D. Warren. Alan Saylor. Cody Redfield. Bradford Coulter. Aiden, Alexander Dice. Jar Jar Slinks. Chosen One pledges his cadre of musketeers to house Kevin. What? All right. Now we're going. He's got flintlocks. Levi Than. Up and Champ. Jonas Engman. Carl. Anthony Mulberry. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation were waiting to hear what, where they pledged their swords to. Elusive Koala. Yanni Margovita. Brooke X. Jesus Christ. Christian Van Skever. Drew Applegate. Jeremy Lowe. Brian Hobgood. Zach Connor. Patreon underscore donator comma yo. Joe Spooky Digital Ghost Tierney. Alicia Grafe. Tom Woodham. Andrew Jadzak encourages everyone to watch Joe Para Talks With You. The Fall Drive episode is lovely. Agreed. Highly agree. Lord Cornwallis. Carson Birkenbeam. Murphy P. Tevin Ticklebean pledges his bow and dual sickles to Chad and 200 of his best friends. Oh wow. my god, we got another one. Oh, Shamanog. Rushy Glenn. Wiggle it. Luke LaFontaine. Chip Handsome. Matt McClellan. Jonas Blotterman. John Barber. Sarah Kemp. Tanya Turtle. Paul Grasso. Juan Jalapena. Joe. Regular name Scott. Alex Moon, the robotic dog. Keith Halcro. Timothy Misadalakis. Clay McCarty. Parker Lee. Ham underscore boat. Vincent Modica. Luke Noodles. Raymond Hernandez. Flemily. The Crow fans, but Hibernal. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Nice word. Matthew Sutton. Hugh Bolin. Zam Bambino. Jeffrey Owen Cahi. Kelsey Kinneman. Russell Kastberg. Xavier Jimenez. Chris Putricus. Scotty Pippen. Brendan Arifin. Meet Virginia. Dungeon Kappa. Nathan Remick. Need more kimchi. MC Hamster pledges his gills to Kevin. Wow. Pretty good. This feels like Christmas morning where you're waiting for a good gift and you're not getting it <laughs> for me. Thank you, MC Hamster. I don't know why you have gills and I don't know what they'll do for me in a combat scenario against Chad and his sickle wielding uh, bowman, but. Well, you control the oceans, Kevin. The subaquatic hamster legions will be very useful to you, Kevin. The oceans don't even have any good restaurants. <laughs> Zach Wary. <laughs> Limp Duck. Stinklitch. Alan G. Jessam. Reed Steubendeek. Tobias Clark. Joey Evans. Carewise Gamgee. Andre Villanueva. Swag Yolo Squire was going to pledge his blade to Kevin, but I haven't gotten my Space Kings book yet, so he pledged to Chad. Wait, all right. This is a weird way to tell me about that, but fine. <laughs> you should have. Also, I, I have email, dude. You can just tell me that way. Cameron Hansen. <laughs> Estimena, Lord of Paul's Pants. Generally depressing. The deadly bulb. Finally, Chris pledges his spectral sleepwear erection and blade to Paul Nelson. I'm glad the blade's different than the erection. I'll take a boner. Ben Bohan. Kieran McNamara. Diet soda. Anthony will be running Space Kings in San Japan and Texas over Labor Day weekend. Nice. Cool. That's a pledge, I think. Jackie Ledoux. Coleman Laguza. Lamb. A pair of Scots. Jonas N. Voltson. Calamity Carl. Germ juice. Levi Kidder. David Gray. Nick Johnson. Bryce Diori. Matthew Bertato. Noah August. Stephen Day. 
Carbson. I am Cornholio. I need TP for my bunghole. Ryan Carroll. Boney. Jeremy Bowser. <laughs> Dr. Diarrhea. Some of Chad's bird friends, we pledge our talons and sharpen beaks to Chad. Yeah, I got air superiority. Nicholas Maloney. Burgers, crunchy PB. Yes, it's still edible. Do not check the expiration date. Sounds pretty crisp. Ninja Bread Men. Megan McCormick Mason. Peanut Burg, level 69. Eric Horwitz. Tiffany Lee. Hello to Kiss Frenchlin. Dr. Egg Drop Soup Man. Thomas Jansis. Aaron Lord. Lucretia McEvil. Mutant Astronaut. Dr. Chocula. Henry Torbear. Adam Knapp. Moon Juice. Logan Derby. Brad Schmelzer. Chick. SSJ Trogdor. Hood Lemon. Plush. Callum Mr. Misfire West. Mendy Nasty. Llama Lad. Skeletorin. Yoplin. Philip Reynolds. Mike Spaghetti Jones. Chicago Frank Returns. Nate Bit G. Ryan R. Davis. Scott Wabel. Mr. Unimportant pledges his fake doctorate to whoever calls dibs. Dibs. I, damn it, I was going to say all my whinging made me have dibs. <laughs> <laughs> Rocco. Josh Hal, what's up, you zealot? What's up? And Chris, hi. Evan Bowen. Danzig versus Sean Astin. The battle for Polly Shore's soul begins now. Danzig wins. Sorry. Sorry, Sean Astin. <laughs> you rock, but Danzig's going to kick your I ass. I don't know. He's, I mean, he's, Although he's Rudy. He is, and yeah, he's pretty buff. I've seen pictures of him real buff. <laughs> I think he could take Danzig. He though. carried the ring and a person. Soggy newspapers. <laughs> Sorry, I got too excited. <laughs> Chris Kulik. Dakota Kemp. John W. Greg Musto. Saturn Video. Kiwi Flurb. Serial Killer X. Wade Norcross. Hi, first time, long time. Allie Rose. Sprinkle Buns. Hilda B. Benjamin Luther. Sira Sin. Dennis Wright. Jover the Moon. Edgar's Crassus. Cameron Ganzevel. Ollie Sutz. Kate the Great. My cart. Matt Septor. Greg Gervasi, a.k.a. Vita Zed. Sup, Greg. Dakota Kipper. Cassandra Harris. Gulliver. Oh, boy. Paul Spiner gets a misdemeanor for slapping a senior tonight at 11. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm getting misdemeanors and not pledges. This sucks. <laughs> Anthony Rodriguez. <laughs> really are the Ramsey Bolton of this, uh, <laughs> this Game of Thrones. I don't even know if that makes sense. Anthony Rodriguez. B. <laughs> Jeff Webb is still a big baby, but we both sincerely appreciate your well wishes. Alpaca acquaintance. <laughs> Taraku, the thing that goes doink in the anime. Doink, doink. The last name was my favorite. So? <laughs> big Nick Lane. Kira and Brian are big fans. The Blade of the Goblin Grader is pledged to the first host to count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I will not lower myself. <laughs> We'll take all of the Forsaken. Come to me, Goblin Grader. <laughs> it just keeps growing more powerful. Chad's horde grows. A dark cloud grows over Burbank. <laughs> Blake, bedtime, having cabin. <laughs> Spencer, why? Dan Antonio. George Props. <laughs> After some soul searching, I pledged my spear to Archmage Ball. Cool. Hey. hey I think that everybody who has pledged to me has really thought long and hard about it, at least. <laughs> No knee-jerk pledges in my my crew. Mine, mine are recklessly endangering themselves. <laughs> James Stavronos. Official Goosebuds chronicler and ledger man. Hello. CM. Farah. Chris Curdo. Cole Gleason. Greb Comics. Tan, your hide. Matthew Pipes, sing for us, please. <laughs> Jesse Boggs. Michael Malloy. Ghost Pitch. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Kyle O'Neill. Robert Holden. Before I say another name, I hope that the person who put Ghost Bitch in knows that Nick has referred to Rebecca as Ghost Bitch before. <laughs> in a very endearing way that she loves. <laughs> okay, well, I want to hear that story later. You got to hear it. It's great. Goon Cahoots. Adam Brindell. Wonder Skin. It feels like real skin. <laughs> Brandon Nichols. Angelo Edward Longton Santone pledges the Holy Blade of Justice to Paul. I have artifacts on my side. Yeah, you got a lot of magic. I got like a Vorpal Blade. Hell yeah. <laughs> like, you can't just call it a Vorpal. That's that's overpowered. That one wasn't. I think the other one was a ghostly blade. So I think I do have a Vorpal Blade in my it's opinion. Not a, not a snicker snack. all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. I've okay. got gills. <laughs> Melodies. Anthony Stoker. Doglips underscore 
Kojoy, Kojoyan, Kojoyan. Let us know how to say that one. Please. Let us know. You don't have to. <laughs> I feel like I got it. <laughs> yeah, I think you got it. nailed it perfectly. Gunner to land. Brony underscore Danza. Funny. Max. Zindane. And welcome new Patreon supporters to the Book of Names, like Spencer Rogers. And Lumo Nuva. Do you feel your blood boiling hurt, aka Cyberbully? Crank to high voltage, welcome to the Book of Names. Thank you for your support, that's an insane movie. And welcome Brian Udath. Thank you all so very much, we love you. Thank you for joining the Book of Names. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.